All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to my talk called Next Generation of Programmable Data Path. It really follows Nick's keynote, which is how should we or how could we program data paths in the future? I am a lot more software focused uh, than, than Nick. Nick is, is definitely coming more from the hardware side. Um, I will focus my talk mostly on the Linux kernel side and maybe eventually other operating systems like the Windows kernel. Um, let's see where the BPF path actually brings us. But before I dig into that, I wanna look back at into a couple of things that happened in 2016. Um, first of all, OVS 2.6 has been uh, released uh, with the, the first ever OVN um, release. And part of that was the require, or part, of, part of the requirement for OVN was the connection tracking uh, feature that was, is required to implement the state for firewall. Justin mentioned this in his talk a little bit. And we went through a great deal of work and discussions, iterations to actually get that merged upstream because in the Linux kernel, all of the, all of the complexity, all of the functionality is shared by everybody. So whenever somebody comes in and says, I need this functionality, I need this feature, all the side effects of that, of that feature will be paid by everybody else. So if I'm adding a new counter and the counter has a side effect as a cost, Google will pay that cost for every packet that they serve. Same for Facebook and all the, all the others. This, this leads to an environment where um, there's a lot of discussion about everything we're adding because everything has some cost. Right? What else happened in, in, in 2016? Um, OVN happened. So I, I, I upgraded my rental to a van. Um, maybe, maybe, that, maybe the oven is not, really happen, is not really happening now, but I think the oven mitt is, is even better. I, I found this tweet a uh, couple of months back. I think it was in October. What else happened? So uh, Ben started, in, started a podcast. OBS Orbit, if you have not subscribed yet, you really should, it's amazing. It's an amazing podcast with, uh, with uh, an amazing content. It's so great, uh, and as we know, like no good idea goes uncopied. So guess what? A couple of months later, Docker followed and they did their own podcast called the Docker Podcast. All right, so what's, not, what's up next? Like we've seen OVS 2.6, we've seen OVN, we have connection tracking in the kernel. So what, what could we work on next? What could, what could happen in the OVS orbit? And we've heard the term a couple of times already today. I was actually surprised how many mentions Nick um, made on the word BPF. It's actually amazing. And I think it is BPF. Um, the design is by the wife of one of the, the BPF's lead engineers. I do have stickers if you want one. Please catch me, I will, I will, I will give you one. So what is BPF? BPF is basically a, it's not just bytecode, like technically BPF is just bytecode, it's a virtual machine, it's like, like a JVM, a, a, virtual multi, a virtual machine that allows to uh, interpret bytecode and execute it. Well, when we talk about BPF, we talk about what's more. We talk about an entire tool chain that has been created. We talk about a verifier. We talk about a JIT compiler. We talk about an entire ecosystem that has been created around it. So let's talk through that step by step. So when we talk about BPF, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard of it. I'm not sure ever how familiar um, everybody is with it, but I'm pretty sure all of you have used it. Because when you run TCP dump and you specify a filter expression, that filter expression, that string, gets translated or compiled into classic BPF, which is bytecode. That bytecode gets injected into the Linux kernel, attached to the raw socket, and every packet that is received will go through that BPF, that classic BPF filter, and the filter will, will, will say, yes, you need to mirror that packet to user space through that socket or not. So this is basically BPF implements the filter you specify on TCP dump. When we talk about BPF now, we're mostly talking about eBPF, extended BPF, and we, 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 uh, we call the old, the, classic, the old BPF the classic BPF because BPF has been around for about 35 years or something like that. So when we talk about BPF, um, and we don't wanna use TCP dump to uh, compile our bytecode, what else can we use? 
There is basically two tool chains that we can leverage right now. There is BCC, which is coming from the IOWISA Foundation, which offers a Python API to compose or to construct BPF bytecode. There's also an LLVM um, backend, which allows to write pseudo C and then invoke LLVM uh, with a BPF backend to generate bytecode. Both, uh, both work fine. It's, it's, it's mainly a matter of your choice, uh, which one you want to use. Once, once we have the bytecode, we, we need to load the bytecode into the Linux kernel. First of all, there is a system call which, um, which allows to load a program. So the, the system call will um, take the bytecode, load it into the kernel. The kernel will look at the bytecode. It will then verify whether the bytecode is safe to run. What does that mean? Um, if you load a Linux kernel module and that the Linux kernel module has a bug, it will crash your kernel. A Linux kernel module could also expose kernel memory, which could be used to exploit a kernel. You could also loop inside a, a Linux kernel module and you will, you will, you will create a deadlock in, on, on the CPU you're running on. The BPF verifier will ensure that you cannot do such things. It will verify that by walking through all possible branches in your bytecode to verify that each and every branch does not access any uh, memory that is, has, not been, um, has not been set to zero. It will, it will ensure that you're not looping. So you can, loop, you can jump backwards, but you cannot create loops. It will also ensure that you are, um, you're not um, referencing memory that, it, that with, with uh, pointers that are not valid, and so on. So the verifier ensures that whatever bytecode you load, it's impossible to, to crash the kernel. Then the next step, once that bytecode is valid and safe, the kernel will actually pass that bytecode through a just-in-time compiler, a JIT compiler. I will take this, the, the, the bytecode and translate into native code, right? Code that your CPU understands. So essentially, in the end, although we have come from pseudo C through LLVM, bytecode, JIT compiler, native, we will run natively without any additional overhead, just as if you would compile a Linux kernel module um, and load it. But we have gained the, the additional safety measures that we cannot crash the kernel, which is vital. Because if you have a bug in your data path code, um, and we're all perfect, we never add bugs, right? But Eventually it happens. If you have a bug in your data path code and it could be exploitable, let's say, by a, by a, by a TCP packet, UDP packet, it could essentially bring down an entire data center. This is very, very serious. So having safety is, is very important. So now we have the BPF bytecode as natively JIT compiled code inside the Linux kernel. What can we do with it? We can attach it into multiple places inside the Linux kernel. So I talked about sockets, raw sockets for TCP dump. Um, there is SecCom, which is used by Google Chrome to basically whitelist all the system calls a Google, a Google Chrome plugin can do. Uh, we can attach it um, to TC, ingress and egress. So that's a traffic control layer of Linux, which basically allows to pass the SKB, that's the, the metadata of a network packet inside the Linux kernel, and pass the, each packet that comes in or goes out the net device through a BPF program. We have XDP coming up, which will allow to run BPF bytecode at driver level directly. So giving, running a, a BPF program for every packet that it is received, but giving it access to the DMA buffer directly, which allows to run a BPF program at the earliest possible point. So we're gaining this, this, all these hook points where we can inject BPF bytecode and run it inside the Linux kernel. So basically what we've gained is the ability to extend the Linux kernel in a very flexible way. BPF doesn't, doesn't uh, include bytecode only, or it's not just bytecode. There's a couple of um, additional functionality that comes along with it. The most important bit is maps. So in BPF, state and code is separate. Bytecode would be the code, right? This, you compile this once, it will run. All, the, all your state is in maps. Maps are basically memory, memory regions that can be global or per CPU. They can be of multiple data types. There can be hash tables, there can be arrays, there can be uh, stack traces, which is, which is for perf, uh, perf tracing um, purposes. 
and so on. We might have additional resizable hash tables in the future. There's, there's lots of potential for additional data types uh, for BPF maps. Essentially what it means that the BPF program can access maps, write to them, and read from them. Additionally, user space can write and read from them. So we've just introduced a way for BPF programs to actually com communicate with user space. We can also have multiple BPF programs attach and access the same maps. So we can have a BPF program on ingress share, 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 share state with a program on egress and so on. We also have access to the perf ring buffer, which is a very, very fast uh, ring buffer used for Linux tracing. So when you run uh, Linux perf, perf will run BPF programs in kernel space, and will, which, will, uh, which will filter out the samples to send user space. And those samples, those perf samples that should go to user space will be injected into a perf ring buffer and user space can read that. But that ring buffer can literally send millions of samples per second to user space. We can also use those for networking now. We'll demonstrate that later a bit. BPF has some limitations though. The, the, the one limitation that is Linux kernel specific is that each program has a limit of 4K instructions. It also has a complexity limit in terms of verifying code of 64K. Why is that needed? If there was no limit on verifying something, an attacker could essentially load a, a program that is so complex, the kernel would never finish or, or end up um, verifying that. Hence, there is a limit on verification and there is a program limit. However, there, is, there are tail calls which allow to call into other programs. It's not a function call though, it doesn't build up a stack frame. It's more like an exec system call. You're replacing your existing BPF program with another one and you can start executing. However, you can take some state with you. So you can, you can parse a packet, um, perform some actions, build up state, take that st state, do a tail call into another program and continue on. This allows you to build up more complicated programs. Last but not least, um, helpers. So bytecode itself um, is in a completely isolated environment. You cannot call into kernel functionality. In order to interact with the kernel and with the outside world, you need to call helper functions. These are specially whitelisted function calls which each, each, each BPF program can make. Depending on where you run the program, you will have different capabilities. For example, it does not make sense um, to allow writing to, a, to, to data at socket level, but it does make sense to allow writing to the SKB at TC ingress level because it's safe to allow that from a kernel perspective. What I've listed, and it's probably way too small to read it because the projector is not very good, but I will, I will so quickly read, read through them. Um, so what we have in terms of helper functions is we can do them, we can access maps, look up, update, delete. We can get the current time, the kernel time, which is the, the GIFIS. We can print K, which is the printf uh, function of the kernel to the trace buffer. We can get a random number. We can get the current uh, CPU, the, the SMP CPU number. We can load and store bytes f into the packet or from the packet. We can replace the L3, L4 checksum. We can get the current name of the process, UID or GID. Um, so this would be the sending process. We can push VLAN headers. We can get set tunnel keys and options. So this would allow for GNAV, VXLAN, GRE encapsulation and so on. We can do tail calls. We can read and write to the perf event ring buffer. That's a fast ring buffer. We can redirect or clone to another network device. So this would be a port forward or, or, or a, a, a mirror operation. We can get the routing real, the routing realm, this is how Linux keeps uh, statistics per route. We can calculate um, checksum difference over a piece of memory. This is important if you're changing huge parts of the packet. You can, you can calculate the, the necessary checksum correction. We can change the protocol of, of the SKB. Um, we added this to the degree that we actually managed to, to implement a full NAT64 implementation inside the Linux kernel with just BPF. Um, we can change the type of the SKB, so we can mark a SKB or a packet as local, even though the NIC did not base, like, for example, the NIC marks a packet based on the MAC address, whether it's meant local or not. We can change that, and we can, we can add initial packets to be considered local. We can check the C group membership. So C group is a, 
um, containment um, instrument inside the Linux kernel to do resource management. Uh, you can also say tasks to C groups, so we can check whether a packet, or the task, task of a packet belongs to a particular C group. Um, we can access the SKB hash. Uh, we can trim the, the, the tail of the SKB, so we can, we can trim the, the packet at, at a certain end. This is important if you're sending an ICMP error in, in return to something. You will, you will write the ICMP headers in the front and it will trim the end and send it back. And we can make the SKB linear, which means we can, we can write all the way into the packet data. So these are the current, the current helpers we have. Um, and this list will probably grow. So I talk a lot about BPF. How do we, how do we, how do we get there? Or, or what, can we, what can you really do with it? And uh, we, started, we started working on an experimental project called Cilium a couple of months ago. And the basic idea was to apply BPF to networking and security for containers. So this is not, an, an, not the same general, general scope as OBS has, but it was specifically tailored for solving container networking. And the very simple vision is to, to generate individual bytecode for each container as it is stored. So if you have 10 local containers, the bytecode for each of them will be difficult, uh, different, and each bytecode will do exactly what that container needs. And because of the, the separation between code and state, so BPF bytecode being the code and maps being state, we can, we can regenerate the pipeline for that container at any time and re-inject it uh, without breaking any connections, which basically gives you the ability um, to upgrade your data path on, on the fly while, while your workloads are running. So this is how, how this looks like. Um, I'll just go over this very quickly. So we have a, with an agent or a daemon that runs on, on each server that generates the, the bytecode, injects that into the Linux kernel. And then we have orchestration plugins that will connect that to like Docker and Mesos and Kubernetes and all the orchestration systems and so on. And we have a monitoring solution that's based on the, the perf ring buffer. Performance-wise, this is, this is what the overhead looks like. The overhead is basically nothing. So these numbers are um, two local containers talking to each other. There is no hardware involved here at all. It's two containers talking to each other, scaling from one to 22 cores, um, one flow per core and 10,000 policies loaded. Um, I didn't mention like how policies work in Cilium. We can talk about that offline. But basically, we did not measure any, off, any overhead introduced by BPF. What we're seeing here is basically the performance of the Linux TCP IP stack for for GSO and, and uh, GRO uh, frames. So the, the, the lessons we've learned over the last couple of months, and I think those apply to OBS as well, is that this enables a completely new way of doing data path development. I've been doing kernel development and networking for 10 years, and we have I've never been able to progress so quickly than with BPF. It's amazing how quickly you can, you can implement data path features. The, limit, the, limit, the limitation clearly is right now is um, verifier complexity. So you need to split your program and you need to be familiar with how the verifier complains and you need to learn to work with the verifier because it will tell you if you're leaving your, your safe boundary. Um, we all also have probably not added the last helper yet. So um, as you need functionality or integration with the kernel, you need to add new kernel and new helpers. If every new helper you're adding, you're making your minimal kernel version required, whatever version you added the helper to. So BPF does not like magically solve kernel dependency, but it makes it a lot easier. Um, before I, I dig into like Q&A, I wanna do a very, very quick demo on like how, how the regeneration works. I hope the screen is big enough. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just adding or running two um, Docker containers. It doesn't really matter. It's basically two net, net, net devices or two network namespaces. And I'm running netperf in both of them. And I'm now pinging between them. And ping will not work. This is something that you will experience as a, as a data path developer very often. What would you do? If TCP doesn't help you, we'll start adding print case to your kernel. You will recompile your kernel, run the latest kernel, and go again. 
we thought that doesn't really scale up, that, 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 that's just a, a time killer. So what we're doing instead, we're, 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 um, we have a, a Linux perfering buffer based debugging functionality built into our VPF stuff. So on the bottom half, I'm running Cilium Monitor, and if I ping again, um, the monitor will actually pick up events that have been sent by the BPF program. Uh, the, the screen is not big enough to really show, the, show everything, but basically the event includes a lot of metadata plus the, the packet data, the, the first 64 byte headers. Um, it's not enough yet, so you want to have some debug information. So let's compile in debug instructions on the, in the BPF programs and just re reload them. That's what I just did here. So this was basically the, a, the same as if I had added manually bring case statements, recompiled more kernel, rebooted, and so on. I just did that with BPF. And if I, as I do that again, again, sadly the screen is not big enough, you would see a lot of debug statements. This would basically tell me that um, where my bug is. Let's say I've, I've figured it out and I'm basically ready to fix my bug, so I'm, I'm opening up um, the source code here. Um, and the issue was that I, re I, I received a unsupported L3 error, um, so let me search for a couple of ones. So the first one looked okay, but this one looks like this, looks like this should be removed, so let's remove that. Recompile again. This would be equivalent to recompiling your entire kernel again. Ping again, and it's working. So all of a sudden, you have you have the, the possibility for rapid data path to, um, development, which I think is something that is extremely useful and will will expedite um, data path development a lot. Thank you. <laughs>